Well, first, let me thank you for taking the time to highlight this critical issue for the region. It really is uh, an alarming situation that we all need to collectively uh, address. Thanks for that question. Certainly, we feel at UNICEF that the situation on water scarcity in the Middle East and North Africa is quite alarming. We view it as a threat to child development and survival, in fact. And we've seen in this region, 11 out of the 17 most water stressed countries in the world are here. This translates to roughly nine out of every 10 children in this region living in highly stressed areas or extremely highly stressed areas. People or communities are having more and more problems on getting access to potable water for drinking. And in some cases, this, this can impact a, a child being able to get to a school uh, because they're busy hauling water for their family. It can also make an impact on the water quality that people are drinking at the household level. We see as groundwater table decreases in certain countries, we see intrusion of contaminants such as salt water, which can have a major impact on the health of a child. I think in general, water scarcity is only going to get worse in this region. So it's a historic issue. It's been around for centuries. We know that and we've been adapting to it. Uh, communities have been, governments have been. But the crisis is getting worse in this region and it's impacted by climate change, of course. We've seen temperatures increasing. We've seen precipitation decreasing. This has a direct impact both on surface water and on groundwater, which are the two primary sources of fresh water. That not only does it impact child health, but it also has the, the, the potential to impact education, like I mentioned. And it also has the impact for, let's just say, conflict flashpoints. So we can have a situation where uh, a community has an at-risk water point that maybe is being used by another community or a water point dries up and that community has to migrate and then is using some, of, some other community's water point. And so these types of situations can be really, really risky. Um, but at the same time, water can be used as, a, as such a foundation for peace building in a community if we do it right, where we can identify the risks around the water point. Yeah, in conflict zones, uh, water scarcity can be a, a, one of the drivers for the conflict, even if the conflict is for other reasons. So, for example, a couple months ago, I was on mission in Yemen, and I was visiting some of the work that UNICEF is doing in, in the south. And there was a group of some 46 families that had just come into a camp that we were supporting. And we, we probed a little bit on why they left that area. And naturally, I assumed it was because of the armed conflict that was ongoing a little bit further north. But in fact, they, their response was because they didn't have any water. So basically, their story was that the groundwater tables had dropped so much and they were relatively close to the coast that they had saltwater intrusion and they couldn't drink the water anymore. There was water. It just wasn't potable water. So these 46 families had to move um, into a, what we call an internally displaced person's camp. So that to me was really startling to see, like, even in this area, Yemen is so well known for the conflict and the displacement due to armed conflict. In this case, they weren't displaced for that reason at all. They were displaced because water scarcity. I was also just last week in Sudan, in Darfur region. I was visiting a UNICEF project that was a peace building project. So basically we had two communities that were having to, I think it was about a two hour round trip to a water point. And they were ethnically different communities. Um, and there was some conflict or potential conflict around that water point because of the distance and then the line at the water point. So we put in a, a water point closer to the community itself. Both, can, both, let's say, groups were there using the water point. Um, there was a line still, but not that long. It was maybe 10 people. My thought on that is, you know, water points as peace building. Now, thanks for that question. There's uh, a lot that we can do to address water scarcity and the crisis that surrounds it. Um, from, from our perspective, one of the first things that we have to do is really advocate with governments to create high-level coordination bodies around water scarcity. 
water scarcity is a, is a multi-sectoral problem. It's not just about drinking water. In fact, in this region, 80% of the water is used for agriculture uh, compared to globally uh, 70%. So we need agriculture around the table. We need industry at the table. We need Ministry of Finance at the table. We need Ministry of Development at the table. And so what we're advocating for strongly is for governments to create high level committees that convene and develop action plans to address a crisis. That's one of our primary recommendations. The second recommendation is, we know that in this region for, for potable water, roughly 50% of the water is what we call non-revenue water. So this means that we, can, we put water into the pipes, but it doesn't come out the other end. So either it's stolen along the way or it's, it's lost due to leakages. So we have a lot of infrastructure in the urban, uh, in urban areas that is outdated and it's not being maintained properly. Uh, another issue that we have is the tariff structure. Uh, this region, the Middle East and North Africa region, has the lowest tariffs in the world. And what this means is then there's less of a value for water and the operators and the utilities that are running the systems don't have enough revenue flow to be able to make the investments necessary to keep the systems operating. So we need to have a healthy dialogue with government and civil society and establish a pro-core tariff um, that is equitable and, and has a, a step basis that charges the most vulnerable less than it charges the, the, the highest consumers. Another recommendation that we, we think is empowering youth to be agents of change on this discussion. So not only on behavior change around water conservation and around awareness raising, but they're the future leaders of the countries. And they are the ones who are gonna be addressing this crisis in 20, 30 years. So if we can build their capacity to understand the problem and to address the problem, we view that as a, as a win-win situation, both for the youth and, and for the systems and for water scarcity crisis to, to be able to address it correctly in the region. Another recommendation that we feel is important is to make sure that the sector water, water scarcity specifically, is included in all of the climate policy that are coming out. So when countries are developing their policy in accordance with the Paris Agreement, we need to make sure that water is a priority sector in every one of those in this region. It's so clear that the future in climate change is going to have this negative impact. In fact, it already is on access to water. And we need to make sure that we have all of the resources possible to fight um, the crisis. And that includes financial resources all of these recommendations we highlight in the running dry report we recently published, and we hope it's a catalyst for both civil society and governments in the region to really reflect on this crisis and know it's going to get worse and take action now, collective action, and UNICEF stands by and ready, ready to support. In fact, all of the work we're doing around this issue of water scarcity is trying to preserve the basic human right of access to water. We know we can't survive as humans without water.